something like time management or marketing, I think it's quite easy to just take it from anywhere. It is, there's not much in time management that you would say would, would violate Islamic principles, right? Hmm. But when I mean, you go into other things like, uh, you know, vision planning and self-confidence. Now, yeah, what you'll find is there's some beliefs that creep in that if you're not really glued up with Islamic aqidah, you end up absorbing beliefs that aren't Islam. You know, like, like the idea that you are the captain of your own ship, you are in charge of your own destiny. Whatever you think it, you can do it. You know, these ideas are not Islam at all. Because we believe in Qadr. We believe that someone could work hard the entire life, but if Allah has not written for them to be wealthy, it's not going to be wealthy. Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of the Optimized Muslim Podcast. Today is one for people who are into self-help, self-development and Islam. A very special guest with me, Sheikh Ismail Kamda. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for joining and just a bit about Sheikh Ismail Kamda. He graduated from the Alamiya program in 2006 and completed a BA in Islamic studies at the International Open University in 2014. He specializes in the fields of fiqh, tafsir and history. The author of over a dozen books in the fields of Islamic studies and personal development. He's the founder of islamicselfhelp.com and currently a research manager at Yakin Institute. So as you can imagine, with Optimized Muslim Project and the stuff that I tend to talk about, this was a guest that I was looking forward to speaking to a lot. And that's because anyone who's researched like the intersection between personal development and Islam would have come across Sheikh Ismail Kamda's work in some form, I think, with islamicselfhelp.com. So I've got a lot of questions that I wanted to ask you. And to get started, if you can just um, tell me a bit about your background, upbringing. I know you're from South Africa. We we're just discussing that briefly. Um, and your kind of journey in a synopsis form up until now. And then I'll branch off into different questions, inshallah. Sure. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Okay, so I think my life story is a bit unique. Uh, born and raised in South Africa, I'm actually fifth generation South African, right? A lot of people don't realize Indians came to South Africa in the late 1800s. So we've been here for a while. So I'm a fifth generation South African. And uh, when I was eight years old, my father was murdered. So I'm raised by a single mom, very righteous single mom. And she always wanted me as an eldest to, to become a, basically an alim, a mulana, a expert in Islamic so That was her dream for, for her eldest child. So when I was 13 years old, she sent me to do the Alimiya program and I graduated when I was 20. So my whole life has been Islamic work, right? I started studying when I was 13, started giving khutbahs when I was 15. Uh, when I was 16, I met Sheikh Ahmed Ida, rahimahullah, and I started getting involved in da'wah work. But that was like a year before he passed away. Like I, I went to, was it bedside, like literally one year before he passed away. I even attended the janazah. Uh, and I've, I've been involved in Islamic work my entire life. So like literally I've been giving khutbah since the age of 15. And I wrote my first book when I was 21. So uh, in my 20s, I, I wanted to bridge my understanding of Islam with other understandings because my Alimiya program was in one school of thought, right? Uh, and I wanted to explore other schools of thought. So I ended up doing a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies. And so basically I did my Alimiya program under the Diobandi the Ulama and my bachelor's degree under Salafi Ulama. And I ended up with a great respect for both traditions, right? <laughs> uh, without being part of either. I don't consider myself Salafi or Diobandi, but I respect both traditions. Uh, I think the, the more broader you study, the more you begin to understand the various uh, branches of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah and see that they have more in common than they actually disagree over. So uh, I did a bachelor's degree as well to go with my Alim, uh, Alimiya. And basically, my personal development journey began in my early 20s. So what happened was I was teaching at IOU, uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips Online University. And he promoted me to faculty manager. And as an Alimiya graduate, I had zero training in management of people skills or leadership skills. So I was like in over my head. 
So I started reading books on personal development just to, to prepare myself for my new role. I started reading things like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, How to Win Friends and Influence People, all, all the basics, right? The ones I always recommend first to anyone. And as I was reading that, I ended up getting so good in the topic that every week people were asking me for advice on time management or self-confidence or management or leadership. And I'm like, oh, I can actually teach the subject. And I also noticed that there was a gap because Back then, are we talking in 2012, so 10 years ago, there were no real Islamic products in this field, right? Back in 2012, we're talking about before even Product of Muslim was that famous, uh, before all these other uh, organizations came about, no one was really talking about the Islamic side. And there were certain aspects of the Western side that I wasn't comfortable with. So I wrote my first books in this field, which was on time management and self-confidence. And I, I started in 2014, my blog, Islamic Self-Help. And it just grew from there, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Islamic Self Help is actually a one man show. The whole website's run by me marketing, web design, everything. So uh, that, that, that's basically how I got into the field of, of personal development. MashaAllah, that's so interesting. And I feel like there's a lot of things that I can take more benefit from listening to you compared to someone that's, say, not involved in this because I'm in the middle of trying to run a YouTube channel, a website. And obviously, I'm working as well as a as a lawyer here in the UK. So I have a lot of different things and I feel like you're the perfect person that I can. So when you say things like it's a one man show, immediately I'm thinking that takes time management because even on a small scale, uploading a single article or blog post sometimes and you can't get the formatting right. And then the WordPress is having issues and there's so many little things. And yeah. mashallah, so much respect for that as well. So... Just you mentioned how you got into personal development as a result of trying to deal with the, the role that you got promoted into. Mm -hmm. And I think my first interaction was Productive Muslim. And obviously that res resonated a lot, a lot of their articles and whatnot. And then I started this project um, in 2017. So before that, I did come across your work because there was only a few sources. I think there was Productive Muslim, there was Islamic Self-Help, and maybe a couple of others but um so that's why i came across your work a long time ago and one question i had for you i know you mentioned that people wanted something from like an islamic point of view or something that took into account islamic teachings or something that's consistent with islamic teachings mm -hmm. how much of a gap now it's 2022 so it's been eight years or so since you started the project or 10 years in this journey how much of a gap do you think there is? Because my thoughts on it are, whilst I do get comments from people that are like, yes, this is really good. I've always wanted like um, Islamic self-development stuff. I also think that someone who's like relatively conscientious and into that stuff, I feel like generally they seek out the Islamic stuff themselves as well because they're already of that kind of mindset. And I feel like nowadays, especially with like the woke culture and stuff, people even non-Muslims, they don't really promote anything that might offend anyone. So they keep their message very neutral that anyone can take benefit from. Um, so a recent example, because I've been consuming a lot of content from this individual is Alex Hormozy. Um, I don't know if you've come across him. He's like a marketer businessman. And I was thinking like 99% of the, 95% of the stuff can just be taken without any negative kind of connotations. So what are your thoughts on that whole kind of question and topic yeah so it really depends on the specific subtopic right like something like time management or marketing uh, i think it's quite easy to just take it from anyone it is there's no there's not much in time management that you would say would would violate islamic islamic principles right hmm. but when I mean, you go into other things like uh you know vision planning and uh self-confidence uh now yeah what, what you'll find is there's some beliefs that creep in that if you're not really glued up with Islamic Aqidah, you end up absorbing beliefs that aren't Islam. You know, like, like the idea that you are the captain of your own ship, you are in charge of your own destiny. Whatever you think it, you can do it. You know, these ideas are not Islam at all because we believe in Qadr. We believe that someone could work hard their entire life, but Allah has not written for them to be wealthy. It's not going to be wealthy. Right? It, this is a... Uh, a, a fundamental part of our Akira that uh, we are supposed to put in the effort, but the results are in Allah's hands. 
And a very strong part of the akida of modern self-help business is that you are in control. You know, you manifest into the world what you want to happen. You know, this whole t- thing of manifesting is, is, is completely un-Islamic. It's, uh, it's basically a shirk. You're basically making yourself a partner to Allah that you can change color. You can, if you think it, you can have it. That's not the way it works. Uh, there is, a, in our religion, there's this balance between you've got to work hard, but you also have to accept your God. Right, and and you don't see this in the self help field. There's like there's no there's no way there for dealing with qadr. So if you look at my website, for example, I've got a lot of work on tawakkul and qadr, because these concepts are like completely pushed aside if you just go into the Western model. There's no tawakkul in the Western model. It's uh, you're trusting yourself. You're putting all your hope in yourself. You you you're basically elevating yourself to a level of nafs worship, where it's all about you, and you become. Uh, the object of your worship. Now, this does, this takes place very subtly. It's not done in a way where they're telling you these things. But if you're reading book upon book telling you that you're the captain of your own ship, you're in charge of your own destination, whatever you manifest in this world is going to happen, uh, and you start to believe that, it can affect your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. You you find yourself not making dua as much. You find yourself not really making the wakul. You find yourself frustrated with your other uh, you know, you'll find yourself wondering, why am I manifesting something and it's not happening? You know, why Allah not giving me what I want? Uh, now, all of this, the, all of this is like on a very fundamental level. Uh, we're not even talking about fiqh. We're talking about aqidah. It's affecting your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it really boils up to these subtopics. And what I have found is that the average Muslim, alhamdulillah, when it comes to fiqh, they're able to see this. You know, they're able to like say, okay, you know, I won't follow this because it's haram. You know, like we're doing marketing. And they, uh, someone promotes like a, a marketing tactic that's uh, shady, you know, that's, and you know, okay, Islam is haram to lie to people. So, so you can figure that out on your own. You can use that filter on your own. But like I've noticed, with the, especially with the younger generation, things like manifesting and controlling your own destiny, and if you think it will happen, they, they seem to be just latching onto these ideas without filtering it. I don't know if they were, it's because they didn't have proper aqida growing up or because they don't realize that these things clash with their aqida. So when it comes to self-help, there's, there's four lenses through which I analyze any information, four filters through which I put any information that we get from outside of Islam. Number one is Aqidah. Does it contradict our Aqidah? If not, Alhamdulillah. Number two is Fiqh. Does it contradict our Fiqh? If not, Alhamdulillah. Number three, Akhlaq. Does it contradict the characters and manners of the believer? Right? And number four, spirituality or the soul. Does it contradict the purification of the soul? So, for example, example of fiqh would be a lot of self-help books tell you that the fastest way to get rich is to, you know, to compound interest. Right? As Muslims, we can't do that. We can't go the compound interest. Mm. That's, that's a haram root of the wealth. But every book I read has, like, literally, if I, if I pull out any book on finance on my bookshelf right now, yeah. that's the number one advice. Think and interest. grow rich. For- so we have to use our fiqh filter. <laughs> yeah. We have to use our fiqh filter and say, hold on, I can't use that route. I have to find another way. Right. Mm. Um, when it comes to purification of the soul, like the soul, there are aspects of personal development today that contradict the soul. Uh, a lot of it would, would, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it gets in the way of tawakkul, right? So, you know, if your tawakkul is low, if you're not making dua, if you're putting your trust in yourself instead, this all goes against the purification of the soul. And this has long term negative uh, repercussions. But also, for example, with goal setting, where if you think success is just being rich and famous, this goes completely against the soul. So mm. a Muslim is not supposed to seek faith. Mm. Uh, we, we're supposed to be seeking the pleasure of Allah and the Akhirah. So this has a this mindset has a very negative impact on this on the purification of the soul. Uh, even akhlaq and adab, you know, I mentioned the shady marketing practices, which a lot of these folks <laughs> promote. Again, that goes against the akhlaq of the believer. We we're supposed to be you know, people of truth and honesty. So these are the four filters. Anytime personal development uh, issues come up and someone say, you know, this is what, what they say, ask myself, does it contradict our aqidah? Does it contradict our fiqh? Does it contradict our akhlaq? Does it contradict the sawuf? If the answer is no on all four fronts, then alhamdulillah, we take it. And most, most advice will not contradict these things. But when it does, it's a big deal. I mean, it, does, it, it can really be a big deal. Mm, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for that because that also helps me a lot as well. Um, especially the way you broke it down into the four lenses. Because I think with everything, 
you can either just talk about it or you can give someone mental models to deal with it. And I think I can take that going forward, um, that kind of filter of like step by step uh, breaking it down. I think sometimes we get like an overall sense that something uh, is on Islamic or but it's good to kind of have it concrete like that. OK, um, so moving on to the next thing. Um, one thing I have noticed, I don't know if you agree with this, is I've heard a few people, Shayuk and people who have studied in some of the Darul Alums in South Africa, they are very um, praiseworthy and positive about the Islamic culture in South Africa. Um, and I do think there are certain cultures that are more practicing than others. Would you say, and the, on a kind of microcosm level, I would um, make a similarity between or comparison between the Gujarati community here in the UK or Somali community here in the UK compared to, let's say, the Pakistani community. From my experience, there's like a, a gap in the level of general practicing culture. Um, would you say that that is a thing? And is that something that you've experienced about South Africa? Well, with South Africa, you have to understand the dynamics of the community. So where I live, the original Muslims of this land are from Gujarat, right? Like, hundred years ago, our, our forefathers came here as slaves and traders. So generally, the masjids, the schools, the the the, the, the madrasas, they're all controlled by people of our background, right? <laughs> so uh, th that community makes up the, the dominant Muslim community of where I love. And there's mm -hmm. good and bad in that. So the bad that comes from it is sectarian. There's mm -hmm. like in my neighborhood, that literally within five minutes of my house, there are seven masjids. And they're like seven different subsets, so like three different Deobandis, one Salabi, three different types of Barelwis, and they all do the time yeah. with each other. Right? Yeah. So we've got this 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 the sectarianism. It, it, it's really bad. Um. Mm. And, and then there's a lot of extremism as well. So by extremism, I don't mean the violent extremism. I mean the the idea that you know, uh, there's a lot of people here who believe like everything's haram, like videoing is haram, not covering your head for a man is haram. And, you know, it's mm. like they, they go to extremes, like everything being haram. And, and that holds us back a bit. Then there's racism. It's a big problem in my community because it's the Gujarats who brought the, <laughs> the, 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 the Islam here. And then uh, now a lot of the Africans are converting to Islam and becoming the majority. And now there's a power struggle over who controls the masjids and who makes the fatwas. And, you know, because for, for, for the bulk of the past 100 years, Indian fiqh was imported to South Africa. And now African Muslims are saying this doesn't apply to us. We need African think. <laughs> and now suddenly there's a, there's a struggle there. And they have a point. I actually, I'm on their side with this one, that our fix is supposed to be according to the orf or the culture that we are living in. We shouldn't be importing other cultures to South Africa. So that's the bad, but there's a lot of good. There is a lot of good. And from the good of living in South Africa is, number one, we have full freedom of religion. Probably more than any other country in the world. Probably even more than Muslim countries. Like, I can say anything. So I can go on a member and give a whole kutpa bashing the LGBTQ community, no one will say anything. Because the South African Charter gives us the religious right that if it's part of our religion to condemn them, we are allowed to say it as a religious thing. This is part of our religious rights, part of freedom of religion, that we're still allowed to say from a religious perspective. Uh, I can go up and, and talk about jihad. I can mention the word jihad and talk about the jihad with the Prophet Islamen. No one bats an island. We have full freedom of religion here. Uh, we have a very strong Muslim community in the sense that like where I live, if I go outside my house, everywhere, see women in hijab, women in niqab, men with big beards, like I said, seven masjids within five minutes of my house. You can hear the adhan. There's like five halal butcheries within a five minute drive of my house. Uh, every mall you go to has salah facilities, at least 10 halal restaurants and takeaways. Every airport has salah facilities and halal restaurants. It's like, in many ways, if you look, go to the major cities, you feel like you're living in a Muslim country. Uh, and, and the strange thing is we, Muslims are only 3% of the South African community. 3%. Mm. But what happens is, is that uh, Muslims are quite wealthy, right? Uh, a lot of them. And so the economy is, is very much uh, centered around Muslims. To such an extent that like when Burger King and McDonald's and Krispy Kreme came to South Africa, they made the decision that every branch in South Africa has to be halal because we're the consumers, even though we make up 3% of the community. But mm. we're the guy, people who spend the most money on eating out. So um, mm. economically, Muslims are very strong in South Africa. Politically, Muslims are very strong in South Africa. Uh, we have Muslims in 
parliament, Muslims who are mayors, uh, Muslims on every level of government. Uh, we have Muslims here, it, it, you know, it, basically every field you can think about, Muslims are leading. The best doctors in South Africa are Muslims, uh, best cricket players are Muslims, you know, the, whichever field you go into, Muslims are dominant, right? Uh, we, uh, we, when it comes to our neighborhoods, what we did right is Muslims live in communities. So we have Muslim neighborhoods. So if you're in that neighborhood, you feel like you're in a Muslim country. But mm. there are other parts of the country that if you go to, you will see no Muslims at all. Like mm. the entire towns and villages where you will not see a single Muslim. Like it's just the major cities. The major cities mm. of the country are like this, where, uh, like this, where I live, um, you know, honestly, if, if you had to come and visit the city, you'd think you're in a Muslim area. Mm. And the, where is that in South Africa? In, in Near the uh, capital or? You know, I, I live in Durban, which is on the east coast of South Africa, okay. right? It's a okay. coastal city. Uh, so there's basically three major cities in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Durban. Uh, and all three have large Muslim populations. And the description I gave now can apply to all three cities. Like all three cities, we walk around, there's women in niqab and hijab everywhere, men with beards everywhere, masjids everywhere, halal food everywhere. Uh, you know, Muslims are, a pre- and the thing is, there's no Islamophobia. That's the best part. Like, it's it's normal, you know. It's like, you can go to the mm. hospital and the doctor will be a woman in full niqab and there's non-Muslim patients and everyone's fine because no one thinks anything of it. Like, Muslims are a normal part of society. Mm, mashallah, yeah, that's very interesting because recently I've had a few guests talking about the concept of making hijrah. And <laughs> obviously, I feel like you've got the ideal situation there and there's also a lesson in that about the impact of wealth um, in terms of a community standing, um, whether that's in politics or just general respect and how a community is viewed by the general population. And I think that's in a lot of Muslim yeah. countries or other countries. There's actually a lot of that in South Africa, right? So for mm-hmm. example, in South Africa, I'll give you two examples of how Muslim people gain respect here. When there was the struggle of apartheid, you know, with Mandela were a lot of Muslims, that right? they were Muslims sharing jail cells with him. I mean, they were also in prison around the same time as him for the same reason. Uh, Muslims participated in the party struggle and that earned their respect. Uh, another example is uh, when it comes to humanitarian efforts, the bulk of charity in South Africa comes from Muslims. Like everyone knows if, if there's a calamity or a struggle in South Africa, you ask the Muslims to help. They're going to help. Like last year, there was riots and lootings across the country. And for three weeks, there was a food shortage. Every masjid opened their doors to Muslim and non-Muslim alike and were distributing free milk and bread. So like mm-hmm. there were lines of non-Muslims out of every masjid waiting to get free milk and bread. And Muslims mm-hmm. were standing guard at every border with their guns to protect their neighborhoods from, from, from the looters and the riots. Right? It was mm-hmm. Muslims who were guarding the neighborhoods. It was Muslims who were providing the food. So Muslims earned respect in this community by, you know, by being charitable, by being generous, by being brave. Uh, by caring for others, by participating in struggles. And also, you know, of course, you need economic power to do all of that. You, you can't distribute bread and milk to an entire neighborhood if you don't have the, the finances to do that, right? So, so the iron economic power is very important for Muslims in this day and age. Um, it's, it's a necessary step even for the revival of the Khilafat that Muslims need to regain economic power first before we can even think of making that big a leap. Mm, mashallah, yeah. And it's even more interesting that they've managed to do that um, with the kind of sectarian issues that you mentioned before because yeah i feel like normally that holds a lot of communities back so i'm particularly kind of intrigued as to how that's happened with that level of divisiveness yeah so i, I what i've seen over the past 20 years is that sectarianism in south africa has has basically boiled down to which must you go to right like 50 years ago it was bad 50 years ago, Muslims would be shooting each other outside masjids. Like, if someone mm. saw someone going to a every masjid, they'll come with their guns for them, right? It was, it was that level bad 50 years. But the next generation mellowed out a bit. The generation of that mellowed out about a bit. And now it's more like, you know, he goes to that masjid, I go to this masjid, you know? And, you know, they, they, like someone who goes to the Bareli masjid might not go to the Deobandi masjid. But when it comes to business, when it comes to every other aspect of life, they like, they put it aside. Uh, it only really gets heated up at, at family events, you know, we had a wedding or a funeral and someone does something that the other person thinks is bidah and then a fight breaks mm. out. <laughs> mm. That's the only time. But 
I, when it comes to community, uh, again, it's a very business oriented communities. Uh, mm. South African Muslims are pretty much uh, businessmen. And it's like, uh, I know in other communities, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, must be a doctor, must be an accountant. Uh, but my background, most of my family didn't even bother with university. We just went straight into business. Like, we were very business minded um, tribe. So, mm. when you come to business, sectarianism doesn't help business at all. So, people don't just put that aside. You want to make money. <laughs> yeah. I think that's similar to like the Gujarati community here in the UK as well. They have that reputation yeah. of being business orientated. Yeah. So that's good. That was a just a little um little side topic, but I was interested to hear what you what you had to say about that. So I was listening to another podcast in which you were interviewed, um, Productive Muslim Podcast actually. And in it you mentioned how uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were always like this, like productive and kind of um, always kind of working towards something high energy. So this is potentially a bit of a tough question, but it is something that I wrestle with because um, I interview some people who are like into psychology a lot on a deep level and they have this um, notion of like, especially nowadays with the conversation about traumas and you have to meet people where they are and not everyone can do this and that. How much of it is self-development, self-help and how much of it is your nature, right? And then how does that translate into the work that you do as well? Yeah, so for me, it's, I think, it's, a, it's mostly my nature, right? <laughs> uh, on, on that, uh, what's, uh, you know, when it comes to personality type, I, I fall in the INFJ personality type. So, uh, and on the when it comes to the the J part, you know, the self discipline part, I get like a ninety eight. Mm. It's like so you're very I'm, like I'm, highly I'm very, conscientious. Yeah, very conscientious. I, I have to be always working on something. If I if I go a week without working towards some greater goal, I feel like I'm wasting my life. <laughs> it's like I just I go into this like, what's the purpose of life? What am I doing with my life? My my whole mind. Is, goes crazy unless I'm working on a major project. So for me, it's very much a personality thing that I have to be always working towards some towards the next level and towards the next goal and towards the higher levels of life. Uh, I can't just sit back and do nothing. Uh, and for me, my personal development has been trying to teach myself contentment, trying to teach myself to relax, to calm down, to enjoy life uh, because I work too much. Uh, this is a problem, my actually, uh, it's a problem I have from a very young age, right? Like when I was in my 20s, my grandmother would tell me I'm working too much. You need to take time for yourself. You need to relax. You need me time. You're only working all the time. Right? She, she would actually tell me I work too much. So uh, this is that my, my problem is opposite. Now, what I've realized from managing people is that most people are on the opposite end when it comes to problems. That you can't get anything done. You know, like I work from home online. And I'll wake up in the morning and right to Isha time, I am working. I'm just one project after another. I will, time just goes. But like I have friends who will do the same thing. They'll say they're going to work from home. They'll wake up late. They're on their, their PC. They'll go to Netflix. And before they know it, it's the evening and nothing got done. Right? So it's like complete opposites. And my whole work is finding the middle part. Where those of us who are but too much into work learn how to balance things, how to have more time for family, more time for friends more time for our health. And those who are too much on the fun side, we bring them more to the middle that, okay, you know, be a bit productive, you know, work in 45 minute bursts, do some work in the morning, find your high concentration time to do your work during that time. So it's just about trying to find a balance because both sides have their flaws, right? Both sides have their flaws. If, if, if you're overworking yourself, you're going to end up having a heart attack and dying young, right? <laughs> and if you're not doing enough work, you're going to end up wasting your life. So it's all about finding the middle part. Uh, and and uh, for me, being productive comes naturally. It's learning to relax that, that, that I have to teach myself. Mm, yeah, because, and I feel like, because me personally, I was, um, I came across self-development content probably when I was 19 uh, in, in, in the form of like interviews and stuff. And then I only started reading self-development content at 23, 24. And, but then I went really deep and like, read hundreds over like the next few years right and the reason I say that is I always had that um kind of need to seek out information but 
I got the internet at relatively late age, at about 16. So I wasn't really, I didn't really have the avenue. And then once I got the avenue, everything became about like research and finding things out and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in terms of, because I sometimes think if somebody's already like that, they don't necessarily need the self-help content. <laughs> so it's like, because they'll figure it out anyway. But then there's other instances where on a minute level or acute level, you can find some self-development tool or tactic that has definitely helped someone. So you know that there is something in it. Um, an example I always give is like, once I remember there was a brother saying he can't wake up for Fajr, right? And I knew the, I knew the brother quite well. So I was quite free with him. So I didn't worry about offending him or anything. So I was like, if you really want to, you can, right? There must be a way. And I suggested he gets this app where the alarm clock app that only goes off once you scan a barcode, right? So I was like, it'll only go off once you scan something in, in your bathroom or something. And then you're already there and you're already awake. And he tried it and it worked. And he, he was telling me like a week later. So then that's like an example of a practical kind of intervention that's helped someone. And then on the other, other side, someone might say, oh, you know, I can't wake up and they have these limiting beliefs and all the rest of it. So that's why I was kind of interested in this topic of um, how you balance the, balance the two between like advising someone from like a self-development lens or um, kind of just letting them, just letting them naturally go through the process. But yeah. Yeah, so again, it really boils down to the individual, right? Everyone starts off at a different level. Mm. I think even for people who are naturally productive, there's a lot that we can learn to build on that because if you could. I also believe that everyone's naturally good at something, right? But if you take what you're naturally good at and you keep building on it, you become a master at it. So like you can be naturally productive, but if you keep finding ways to be more and more productive, you become like, uh, you know, like superhuman level of productive. <laughs> okay. You can reach that level, right? Where, where like uh, people can't understand how you get so much done. You know, it's like, yeah. it seems impossible to others. So I feel if someone's already naturally good at productivity and they go into this field and study it, you know, they can really reach ridiculously high levels of productivity mm -hmm. because really there is benefit. I mean, to be honest, a lot of self-help books out there are a waste of time. A lot of it is like fluff. Like there'll be three points mentioned in the introduction and the rest of the book is just repeating those three points in different words with examples, right? Uh, but then you get books that are like, sometimes you read like a 20, like a 200 page self-help book. And you just find one tip in there that completely levels up your productivity. It yeah. just takes one tip, like whether it's a shortcut key on your computer or, you know, a new way to make money or uh, a new way just to stay uh, awake or to stay uh, productive and alert. Just one tip can completely ramp up your productivity. Like one tip that helped me completely change uh, my productivity was the issue of figuring out your peak performance time. Right? So... Basically, what, what, what this theory says is that some people are early birds, some people work best late at night, and some people are most productive in the afternoon. Now, I was trying to be an early bird, and after working with this, I figured out I am most productive in the afternoon. Right? I'm not an early bird. So I reshape my entire time management schedule around that. In the mornings, I do uh, the things that do not require my performance. I, I will read a book. I will listen to a lecture. I'll do my administration work. Um, you know, I'll do all of that in the morning. The afternoon, I'm either teaching, recording videos, or writing a book. I do that in the afternoon. From 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., I do my most productive work. Mm -hmm. Now, if I didn't learn about peak productive time, I would have just been just trying to do everything in the morning. And I wonder why is it in the morning I'm too tired to write? Because I'm not a morning person. It's not, it's, it, uh, my brain is at, at, at its best in the afternoon. So just finding one tip like that supercharged my productivity that now I write at a time where I'm able to do my best. And, 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 and the rest of the time doesn't get wasted because I know, okay, in the morning I'm tired. So instead of doing something that takes a lot of energy like writing, I do my admin work. Admin work is boring. You know, it doesn't take that much uh, brain power. You know, you can do it while having your coffee or while still waking up. So sometimes it's just that one or two tips you find in a book that can be completely life-changing. Uh, you know, like, for example, before I started Islamic self-help, I read the book, The 4-Hour Work Week by Timothy Ferris. Now, a lot of people say that that book's a waste of time and things like that. But honestly, 
Islamic self help came from that book. Mm. I literally spent like four hours a week running Islamic self help, and and alhamdulillah, it's profitable. It benefits thousands of people. The whole concept of having a blog with online courses and eBooks uh, that benefits thousands of people, and I only spent four or five hours a week running it, came from reading that book. That's where I got the ideas from. Uh, mm. And I really took a lot of the principles in there and applied it to the blog. And alhamdulillah, I, I, the blog basically runs itself at this point. I just have to blog once in a while and do some marketing and put out some new eBooks and online courses every once in a while. Uh, and otherwise, it, it basically runs itself. So, you know, even if you already are productive naturally, there's still a lot you can learn to become a master of the field, you know, to become a mm. ninja at productivity. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Sometimes I think I've heard of so many other people's businesses that have started as a result of the four hour work week that I think, imagine if he was Muslim and the amount of sadaqa jariya that he would have, the amount of kind of good deeds that would have built up. And, um, but yeah, and what you said about finding a tip, like a small tip in a larger book, that definitely I can relate to that because once you've read a certain amount within the genre, it's like you said, it's a lot of the same things. And then a lot of repetition. Yeah. yeah. And then someone has like a successful TED talk, um, like the five second rule, and then they'll make a whole book out of it. And like you said, you just need to read the title essentially. And then the rest is just examples. One yeah. a recent example of that is that book on, uh, what is that new book on, you know, the early hours or something, but waking up early. It's so like a okay. whole 300 page book on the importance of, of starting your day early. The 5, like, 5 a.m. routine or something. Or something like that. Yeah. But yeah. Like, I read the introduction and I said to myself, I'm not reading this book because as a Muslim, we already know this. <laughs> we already practice this. And this is just repetition. Like, how did he fill 300 pages for that one point? It's like, just repetition upon repetition and somehow yeah. it became a bestseller. <laughs> yeah. A recent example I can think of is. Um, I learned about, it's linked to your energy management thing, um, NSDR, which is like non-sleep deep rest, which is basically like um, this neuroscientist, Andrew Huberman, talks about it. And a lot of people talk about the benefits of a nap, and I know that's within the sunnah as well, the like Qaylula. But for people who can't get to sleep sometimes, this is just a way of kind of switching off. And it gives you, it kind of resets your dopamine in a sense of like, it gives you like a boost of energy that I felt. And that's like one of them small things that supercharges everything else in a way and um it's an example of what you said so um the next question that i had was um i was going to ask you actually about some of your own practices and you've already gone into that about the energy management peak performance how long ago because i know you said you overhauled everything how long ago was this kind of realization would you say uh, about seven years ago Okay. That, that's when I, you see, like in my twenties, I wrote about three books and in the past seven years, I wrote about 10 books. So one of the things that really helped me write more books was just my afternoons are dedicated to writing. And mm. as long as my afternoons are dedicated to writing and another habit I built over the past eight years is I force myself to write a thousand words minimum every day, whether I'm in the mood to write or not. That's like my base minimum. Even if I'm not writing a book, write a blog, blog post, write a journal entry, write what's in my head that's bothering me and, and stopping me from, from writing a book. Just write something. So my body and mind get into this habit that every day at this time we are writing. And what, what I found with that habit is eventually I'll start by writing down my thoughts about what's bothering me. And that may evolve into a blog post and that blog post may evolve into an idea for a book. And somewhere down the line, I have a full book that developed. <laughs> mm. like this, this is how my book on self-confidence came about. Like. Uh, I had very low self-confidence in my 20s because I, I'm very introverted, right? So uh, I'm a highly introverted person. And in my 20s, if you told me one day you could have your own online business and you could, you know, I I'll always tell people I hate business, I hate money. Uh, I'm not a businessman, right? I had very low self-confidence. So I used to write these notes to myself to build my own self-confidence. And alhamdulillah, my book on self-confidence, which has reached over 5,000 people today, uh, it evolved from those notes. Like I put the notes together, rearranged it, and I realized that it's beneficial to others as well. And I published it as a book of self-confidence. So, uh, you know, uh, some of the, this, the, the, these are some of the habits that help me is writing a thousand words a day, identify my peak performance time. Another thing that helps me is get staying healthy. 
That is very important. A lot of people don't do this. I, I, again, I, as I said, people overwork themselves and have a heart attack at age 40. It's all up, right? It's over. Uh, staying healthy. So, you know, I mentioned my grandmother. Allah, let's see, she passed away a year ago. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was taking her to a hospital for a checkup. And I was telling her the car about everything I'm doing. And she told me, Smile, what are you doing for yourself? I said, what do you mean? She said, you're doing all these things, you know. You're not relaxing. You're not taking time for yourself. It's not healthy. You know, you must have me time. You must look after yourself. And my grandmother was basically, a, you know, the natural self-help expert. You know, the wisdom of old ladies. <laughs> and so I took advice so hard. And right till today, I always make sure that I get my me time. Uh, I eat healthy. I sleep enough. I do enough exercise. Uh, I take my vitamins. I make sure I stay healthy. Mm. Um, because if you're not healthy, you can't perform. You just can't perform. No matter how 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 much stuff you try to put into a day, if your brain is tired, if your body is tired, if, if you've got a whole lot of sicknesses going on, you're not going to get anything done. So staying healthy is very important. Uh, another thing I do is I take breaks as soon as I realize my concentration is waning. So uh, I'm going to probably get in trouble with, with some of the more conservative members of the team. But uh, I keep this at my right next to me, right? Uh, when my brain is tired, I take a break from work, play video games for 10 to 15 minutes, and then get back to work. And that resets my brain. You know, that dopamine hit and mm. uh, that relaxation, it resets the brain. And I find myself being 10 times more productive than if I just work for five or eight hours nonstop. Right? So I know some people don't like that idea of video games. They think it's childish or I think it's haram or whatever. But for me, it, it really helps me with my productivity because it, it gives my brain a chance to reset. Uh, I also, one thing that I like to do is I like to do a weekly review at the end of every week to write down what have I accomplished, what went wrong, how can I do better next week? Mm. I like to do this at the end of so every week. So it's like a muraqaba. Uh, it is. And like, for example, last week, I thought I didn't accomplish anything because there was a death in the family. There was a major funeral. Uh, we all were going crazy. So I sat down at the end of the week. I'm like, I don't think I accomplished anything this week. I wrote down my weekly review. And end up coming up with 10 things I accomplished during that week. And I was like, oh, alhamdulillah, I don't even remember doing any of this, but it got done. You know? mm. and, so, and, and that helped me to elevate my own mood because, you know, when you're going through, the, through, through, through difficult times, uh, you know, your whole day at week just becomes a blur. Like you can't remember anything. All you can remember is that one bad event that happened during the week. But like when you do your weekly review and, and things like that, you end up, um, you, you, you end up re- remembering all the good from the week as well. One last habit I'll share uh, is that every morning I do gratitude journaling. And I actually have a gratitude journal that I'll be launching next month, inshallah, uh, pro- with the Athene Institute, right? I, I, I'm hoping to launch a gratitude journal soon. But this is uh, something I've been practicing for about six years now. Every morning when I wake up, no matter what's going on in my life, I try to think of at least three things I am grateful for. I write it down and I say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Like one year ago, Pandemic, lockdown, two loved ones had passed away, riots were going on, looting was going on, there was a food shortage. I woke up in the morning, I wrote down, Alhamdulillah, I am alive, Alhamdulillah, my home is safe, Alhamdulillah, my family is safe. And I was able to start my day with a mindset of gratitude and able to have a productive day with everything else that's going on around. Right? That, that attitude of gratitude, it, 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 I think it prevents us from going mad. <laughs> really, because otherwise, you know, the test of life can just absolutely destroy you. So I feel having an attitude of, of gratitude really uh, helps to keep you sane, to keep you productive, and uh, to keep you optimistic e- even during the darkest of times. So yeah, th- these are some of the habits that I practice on a daily basis. I was just crossing off as you were mentioning because these were some of the questions I had. And it's nice that you also touched upon some of the, not negative, but some of the other side when things don't go right and having a gratitude practice. Because I think... Ordinarily, what happens is, me personally, I don't see it this way because I'm inspired by people like yourself and inspired by people who are doing a lot of things and managing time. But some people, perhaps from a different perspective, they think, oh, you know, someone who's like this, they don't have any fun and they're like very regimented. But the way I think about that is just like someone has optimized their work time, they apply the same mindset to their free time and it means they get more out of that as well that's like a good way of thinking about it because otherwise if you just leave that to 
randomness you're not really going to have a structure and you're not really going to have anything so um branching off to the next question you mentioned the gratitude practice um you uh what about goal setting as in what are your do you have like a formal process of writing down goals and, and things like that Be how would you um if you can just talk about that for a while yeah sure this is actually one of the main things i teach people in personal development uh is the importance of having a vision and the importance of setting goals right so one of the reasons why i, I teach this is i've noticed a lot of young men uh you know we have this problem today of the man child you know the guy who's like in his 20s or 30s he's got no motivation in life but he's just sitting and playing video games all day and uh how do you get someone out of that? How do you get someone out of that and, you know, get them productive? And I found what works is teaching them vision planning and goal setting. Because if you've got nothing to work towards and you're born into a relatively wealthy family, right? So you're not even in survival mode. You can literally just sit at home and play video games all day and your whole life will pass by. So for someone from that background to get them out of it and to get them into actually being productive, they need vision. They need goals. And so I spend a lot of time teaching youngsters about vision planning and goal setting, especially young boys. Um, I think for girls, it comes more naturally. For some reason, this generation, the, the girls are very motivated and the boys, a lot of them are very lazy. So especially with the young boys, I have to teach them. But for myself, the way it works is uh, I have my 10-year vision, right? And uh, based on that, you know, you get that way. You feel like it's yeah, exactly, coming and yeah. it doesn't come. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Vision planning, 10 years. And I teach this to my own teenage sons as well. Where do you see yourself in 10 years' time? And how do you get there? Right? So if you have a 10-year vision and you work backwards, you get set your goals. So in 2012, I had a vision to be a full-time author, right? To go full-time into writing and publishing. And back then, everyone told me, that's impossible. There's no money in writing. No one reads books anymore. But I wrote my first book, started my first blog, wrote my second book, started working as a freelance writer, started writing for other organizations. Two years ago, Yakino Institute offers me a job as a researcher, makes me the head of book publications. Now my full-time role is either writing books or publishing books. Right? But how did I get here? Ten years ago, I had a vision. I had goals. Now, Ten years ago, Yakino Institute didn't exist. Right? Ten years ago, Islamic self-help didn't exist. Uh, 10 years ago, I had one book to my name, right? but I had a vision and I had goals and you're not going to accomplish exactly what you envision, but it's going to take you in that direction. And like I, 10 years ago, I didn't know freelance writing was a thing. I didn't have Islamic self-help. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing today didn't even exist, but the vision was that I want to go into writing. I want to go into books. I want people to start reading again and I want to be, I want to contribute to that process of people reading again. And Allah helps you along the way. He opens the doors. He starts the channels for you. He gets you in contact with the right people. Uh, but you have to have an idea of where you want to be and what you want to do uh, to get there. Now, when it comes to goal setting specifically, I use the SMART goal system, right? To be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, mm. and time-bound. Uh, and I do this for every mini project I set out, whether it's a book or an online course, uh, I break it down specifically, what am I writing about? Measurably, how long do I want the book to be? 100 pages, 200 pages. Uh, you know, do I have the tools? Do I have the resources? Is, is it realistic that people are going to buy a book on this topic? And then time bound, I give myself a deadline. I'm going to write this book in six months. I'm going to publish it by March next year, you know, something like that. And then I set the deadline and I get to work and I get it done. So the smart goal system works amazingly well for me. I use it at my day job as well, right, uh, for book production. I uh, make sure that every book has a deadline. It has uh, broken down into steps. And I, we know what books are coming out for the next one and a half to two years. So th this is how I handle goal setting. But goal setting has to feed into a broader vision. That, that's, the, that's the main point. If you don't have a vision for your life, then your goals are going to be all over the place. Mm. Right? Like you're going to have one goal that, that you want to be an author. But you're going to have another goal that you uh, want to start a masjid, right? Uh, and running the masjid might be a full-time job. And being an author might be a full-time job. And now you're stuck now. Which one do I focus on? 
So if you have a broader vision of who you want to be and what you want to do with your life, you can streamline your goals now to fit in with that vision. And any goal that doesn't fit in with that vision, you can say, hold on, someone else should do this because, you know, I'm working towards this vision, right? So you're not saying nobody should do it, but if it fits in with somebody else's vision, they should be doing it instead. Uh, and that's why I think vision planning comes before goal setting. Because if you don't have a vision, your goals are just going to be random and you're not going to be going anywhere in life. Uh, the the metaphor I give to the youngsters is a, an RPG video game, right? When you're playing a video game, you're leveling up. You're working towards the end of the game. To level up, you have to learn new skills. Every time you learn new skills, the game gets harder, right? And then you have to learn new skills to level up again and beat the next boss until you get to where you want to go. But if you don't know where you're going, you don't want to know what skills to get or how to level up. And mm -hmm. that's life. Life is is like that. We are constantly leveling leveling up. We're learning new skills. We're unlocking new uh, powers within ourselves, things we didn't know we are capable of doing. Uh, we're becoming a better person than we were the year before. But every time we do that, life gets tougher. Allah sends new challenges into our life, right? And then you have to level up again to meet those challenges. But if you don't know where you're going, then you don't know what you need to learn. Like I wanted to be an author. I studied writing. I studied publishing. I studied web design. I studied how to start a blog, how to run an online business because I know where I want to go. So these are all mini goals along the route to attaining the long-term vision. So that it, vision planning is far more important than goal setting because if you don't know where you want to go in life, you're not going to come up with a set structured goals. It's just going to be random things to make you feel good. That, oh, I accomplished this. I accomplished that. It's mm. not going to be leading to anything bigger. Mm, yeah and another way of thinking of it is like you have to make sure the ladder is against the right wall before you start climbing and then otherwise you might spend years climbing it and realize it was the wrong kind of vision or goal to start with and um yeah and i know people who've done that i know a lot of people who've done that that they worked very very hard to get somewhere and when they got there they were extremely depressed and realized that hold on i don't want to be here <laughs> how do i get out and then you have the sunk cost for the fallacy that, hold on, I spent 10 years working towards this. I might as well just stay here and do this now, even if it mm. takes me myself, right? mm. Yeah, just, yeah. Another thing I feel like um, this should happen naturally, and it does amongst Muslims because there's a shared, anytime there's a community with a shared group of beliefs, there's obviously certain presumptions that you can pretty high confidence say that this person shares the same beliefs and you kind of relate on a different level and that's similar to someone who's um into self-development in the conventional sense because you know a lot of the terminology they they kind of have the same mindset like things like you know you mentioned sunk cost fallacy um growth mindset four hour work week online entrepreneurship so there's like a certain level of relatability that just communicates that and i was mentioning this point um in a recent interview as well about how even non-muslims who are into self-development it gives you a lot of avenues for you to do that work because say if i meet someone at the gym at like five six in the morning and they're on self-development and they're into like sleep techniques and biohacking and all the rest of it you have a lot more positive connection points with that individual compared to like you know like the general stuff of just sports and celebrity gossip and all this stuff that Muslims might not, sports is fine, but other stuff like films and stuff that Muslims might not necessarily want to get, get into that much. Um, so I feel like there's a shared language and shared, you can say beliefs in the loose sense um, or shared terminology, let's say, that you can leverage as a Muslim to attract people towards Islam as well with self-development. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, there's not too many left now. Um, so I wanted to learn about, you know, once you finished the Alamiya course and you were like 23, 24, what, so I know when you started Islamic self-help, but what was the period between like the Alamiya course and Islamic self-help? Um, like, what did you do in that period? Yeah, that's a point in my life most people don't know about. <laughs> Uh, the, before he was famous part of <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I actually graduated when I was 20 right because I started when I was 13 okay so right. when I graduated uh, at the age of 20 uh, I got married right and uh, within a year my first son our year was born so he's actually 15 now Zayla <laughs> 15 years ago um, 
And I started working. I was kind of like just trying different things, trying to find my place in the world. So I worked a few months for a Dawa organization. I worked as a school teacher. I worked as a school administrator. Uh, I was basically bouncing around from job to job, trying to figure out, you know, what am I supposed to do next? <laughs> and in 2007, I met Dr. Bilal Phillips, right? Um, so first it started off, I, I started emailing him. We were talking to each other via email. And he, that, that year, Dr. Zaki and I had the peace conference in Mumbai. And Dr. Bilal Phillips was one of the guest speakers. So I flew up to Mumbai to attend the conference. And I wanted to, I told Dr. Bilal Phillips, I'm coming to the conference, I want to meet you. Had you been in the conference? Had you been in India uh, before? India before. Okay. No, that was my first trip to India. Mm. So I arrived in India. I didn't book a hotel or anything. Uh, my wife's cousin picks me up on his motorbike, drive around from hotel to hotel to find me a room. Um, and it just so happened that he used to work for Dr. Zakir. Like he used to be a member of the IRF. So he had contacts there as well. So I get there and there's these bodyguards towards a VIP area. And Dr. Bilal Phillips is in the VIP area. He's, he's either there or he's in the five-star hotel. I can't get to him. So it's a 10-day conference. Eight days go by, I don't get to meet him. I get to meet many other people. I met some of them I'm still friends with right till today, right? Uh, but I didn't get to meet the man I came there to meet. And on the eighth day, I'm sitting in the back. There's like 30,000 people in the audience. I'm like in the 20th row. And I look on the screen, and I see Dr. Bilal Phillips is sitting in the front row. But there's literally bodyguards across from the 10th row onwards. So I move towards the middle of the row, and I hop over the seats. And every time no one's looking, I do that, and I do that, I do that until I get to the second row. And then I reach out my hand, I greet Dr. Bilal Phillips, introduce myself. Then he speaks to the guard to tell him that I'm to allow me to the VIP area for the rest of the program. So for the next three days, I enter the VIP area. He introduces me to Dr. Zakir Naik, to Asim al Hussein, Hussein Yi, Yusuf Vestas. I get to meet all of them, spend time with all of them. And Dr. Bilal Phillips basically uh, becomes like a mentor to me at that point. I, I started working for him at IOU. I did my bachelor's degree through IOU. Uh, I spent the next 10 years of my life uh, basically working for Dr. Bilal Phillips. Right till 2020, I worked for him, actually. So we say from 2007 until 2020, that 13-year period of my life was with Dr. Bilal Phillips online. I actually lived with him for two months in India as well. Uh, he was setting up an Islamic school there, and I was teaching at the school. But that didn't work out, so we moved on to the online projects instead. But for 13 years of my life, I was with Dr. Bilal Phillips online, uh, started off studying, did a bachelor's degree online, then teaching in the bachelor's degree program. Then I was the faculty manager there, uh, and I was the faculty manager right till 2020. So a large portion, portion of my life went with, you know, serving Dr. Bilal Phillips online university. Uh, and that's really where I built my, my reputation and my experience and where people got to know me because during those 10 years working for Dr. Bilal Phillips, uh, I've had thousands of students from around the world who I taught fiqh, aqidah, tafsir, and hadith too, um, and, and history as well. So I, I, I gained thousands of students around the world, and alhamdulillah, that, that's where I was able to really build my reputation as an Islamic teacher. And because it was an online job, uh, I had a lot of spare time. That's when I started Islamic self-help on the site. So about five years into that job, I realized I have a lot of free time. I don't want to waste my free time. That's when I read the four-hour work week and said, hold on, why don't I start a blog and see where it goes? And Islamic Self-Help started from there. So I, uh, you can see I met Dr. Bilal Phillips in 2007. I started Islamic Self-Help in 2014. That's like seven years later, mm. right? Uh, and that, that basically, that, that, that if, you try, if I try to remember that period of my life, like from 2008 to 2013, it's just one image of me sitting on a computer and typing. I can't remember anything else that happened that five years. It's like, I don't remember anything else that happened during that time. That whole point of my life is, is a blur. Mm. Uh, I think I only really got into excited about life once I started Islamic self-help. Before that, it was like, you know, when you're young and you're working and you've got kids, uh, like you're in survival mode. You're just like paying the bills and getting through the day. And, you know, it, 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 it's not like how at the, st the stage of life I'm at now, I tend to enjoy my work, focus on, on, on long-term goals. Uh, I don't have anything that I like saving up that I need to buy for the home. I don't have any debts. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in survival. So I'm actually able to, to focus on, on, on deeper topics and, and deeper projects and, and you know more long-term goals. But back then, when I was in my early 20s, 
you just worry about paying your next book. And every month, you're just going like working, paying mm-hmm. your bills, working, paying your bills, mm-hmm. working, paying your bills. Alhamdulillah, I managed to get out of that once I started Islamic self-help because once you get multiple streams of income, uh, you're able to really level up your life and get out of that survival mode. And once you're out of survival mode, then Alhamdulillah, you can start thinking about deeper projects and bigger bigger topics. Mm. Mashallah, I think you have a really good way of um, answering questions that sometimes the person doesn't ask, but they kind of want to know about as well. Do you understand, like, for me as yeah. someone who's yeah. six or seven years younger than you, uh, maybe, um, you have that about financial security, that question is in your mind, and it's nice for you to kind of talk about that yeah, as well. Yeah, so just, just some advice on that, right? So this is something I learned very late in life, and so I teach it to my kids because I don't want them to learn it late in life. What I learned is that if you work hard in your 20s, then... You can reach a level of financial stability in your 30s where you can relax a bit, right? And if you continue to work uh, hard in your 30s, and you won't have to work as hard as you did in your 20s, but you can continue to work hard in your 30s, you can become really, uh, what's the word, Chief? The word I use is powerful. You can become really powerful in your 40s and 50s. Like if you look at the mm. people who are making a difference in the world, like the real world leaders, the people who are game changers, international influencers, they're all between the ages of 40 and 60, mm. right? Because they worked hard in their 20s and 30s. They built themselves up. Now they don't need to worry about money. They don't have to worry about survival. They've built a reputation over 20 to 30 years. Everybody knows their name. Everybody knows, you know, what they are capable of doing. They actually have the power to make a difference in the world. They're actually able to say things that influence policies. They're able to create new systems, build new uh, industries, they develop you know, new businesses. But... You, you don't reach that level in your 20s. This is, a, this is the problem our generation have that we're looking for get-rich-quick schemes. You know, we want to be multi-millionaires by age 25. Mm. Life doesn't work like that. Mm. You know, you have to build, you have to go through the grind. You have to work hard. You have to, uh, you have to put in the level of effort where later when you look back, you appreciate what you went through and you learn through the experience and you grew through the experience. Uh, mm. And what that does is that if you are working hard in your 20s, your 30s will be a bit easier. Your 40s will be a bit easier. I'm talking about financially. Other aspects of life, the tests are going to get worse. They're going to get more difficult. But life is a test. But financially, you should be getting more stable with each uh, decade because uh, your salary should be going up, right? Plus, you're developing other sources of income, worth it, investments, etc. So you're getting multiple streams of income. So by 25, you have one job, one source of income. By 35, you may have your job plus your side business plus some investments. By 45, hopefully owning a few properties as well, right? So financially, life should get more secure and more easier. And I think, you know, what that means is that in your 40s and 50s, you're now able to really make a difference in the world. You're able to say, okay, my kids are grown up. They're out of the house. I don't have to worry about parenting anymore, right? Uh, I have money. I have property. I don't have to worry about working for money, for survival anymore. Now. What do you do with that money and with that time? What do you do with your 40s and 50s? You can focus on deeper topics. You can focus on, on, on politics. You can focus on the economy. You can focus on, on uh, you know, humanitarian work. You can focus on philanthropy because you have the time and you have the resources. But you're not going to get there unless you work hard in your 20s. That's what a lot mm-hmm. of people don't realize. You're not going to get there by 40 unless you work hard in your 20s. And, mm-hmm. and what's happening now is too many people are wasting their 20s. And so they're not getting to that stage of their life. You know, hmm. and another thing that worked for me is avoiding debt. I, I live a debt-free lifestyle. Marshall. Like I've never purchased anything major on loan in my life. Like last year, for the first time in my life, I bought a brand new car and I bought it cash. <laughs> Until then, I drove a used car. For the bulk of my life, I drove I drove used cars with all their faults, with all their bumps and their dents and faulty engines. I drove used cars for most of my life. I saved up money, and when I did buy a brand new car, I bought it for cash. I got the other Black Friday sale, so I got a good discount on it. But <laughs> uh, the, the point is, I never bought anything on loan in my life. Like, I'm renting and saving money to buy a house cash. I'm, I'm, I refuse to, to get involved with the Riba based loan at all mm. or anything. So, I live a completely debt free lifestyle. And I believe there's more baraka in that. Mm. There's a lot more baraka in a debt free lifestyle. And it's much harder. It is hard. Yeah. It's, you're not taking shortcuts in life. Uh, but uh, the long term baraka is a lot. That, that, that's something I, I truly believe and something I'm starting to see the fruits of now. Like mm-hmm. decisions I made in my 20s, not to buy a car on loan, not to buy a house on loan. I'm starting to see the fruits of that in my late 30s. Mm-hmm. 
Mashallah, yeah, that's really inspirational. And I have um, heard this theory about the different phases of life and it makes sense because say even if you start off from a working class background or you don't start with like a, a massive inheritance it's i think there's a famous basketball player or someone who said a similar thing where eventually if you're a hard worker and if you're someone who's kind of working hard and productive and self-improving and trying to work on yourself from an islamic perspective as well so you deal with like the illnesses of the heart and things like that that's through your 20s. Eventually, it's going to compound that word, but without the interest connotation. Yeah. Sooner or later, it's like if you spent 20 years at it or 15 years, even 10 years, the difference between someone, if you, someone like yourself who's on it compared to someone who's basically starting afresh and they've not gone through those same challenges and they've gone for the shiny objects in their 20s it's going to be night and day. And that's when it kind of shows. I think nowadays, especially with debt here in the UK, the temptation is, or in Western countries, um, you, you finish from university and because there's like an expectation that this person should be doing well, it's easy to look the part because even if you're on an average salary, finance a nice car, finance a nice apartment potentially, and you can just play that game for a while. But it's, it's like a very you get more and more entrenched in the system because everything's debt-based. And then sooner or later, you're doing things that you don't enjoy because you need to do it to support your debt and your lifestyle. That affects your inner kind of peace because you're not, your life's not moving in a direction that um, you feel like it should. And that it all links. So you know how you talk about the Baraka effect of it all. Um, I feel like a lot of people, unfortunately, they have that rude awakening at too late stage um but yeah so definitely that's that's very uh important what like you mentioned. for me for me i feel like there was only one point in my life where i ever fell into debt and that was because uh i just lost a job and i was forced to you know live off my credit card for a while and i know mentally just knowing you're owing people money and there's interest piling on it it completely took its toll on me i would never want to be in that situation ever again so like you know, I, I am very careful with money. I'm very careful to make sure I'm earning more than I'm spending. Uh, I will never, ever want to fall back into that, you know, again. To, to, and I think about, like, if you own people on a house, and I look at, I look at, the, at, at, at you know, the interest rates of houses, you end up paying double the price, you know, on, on a house over time. Like, in the South African currency, if a house is $2 million, you know, when you're paying it over 40 years, you end up paying $4 million or $5 million, right? Uh if you save money and buy cash, which again, it's not necessary. You can look off rent your entire life. That is something that's an option. I think there's, our people have pride in them that, oh, I can't be renting in my 30s or 40s, mm. right? But you let go of your pride and, and you're humble for the sake of Allah. You can't rent your entire life and nothing's going to happen to you for mm. renting your entire life. You know? Yeah. There may be more barakah in that. Yeah, actually, I found one benefit I found out of renting is anytime my house grew too big or too small for me, I could just move to another house. <laughs> mm. You know, like, You've got more more kids and your kids are getting bigger and they need their own space. You know, you don't, you're not stuck in this mortgage. You can say, okay, you know, give your landlord two months notice and move to a bigger house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your kids grow up and move out and now you need a smaller place. Okay, again, move to a smaller house. Yeah. Right? You have more flexibility like that. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to rent. Yeah. Uh, but what I found is that with the people I know who have these debts or, or you know, like, I let me give you a very practical example. There's one guy I knew in my 20s who I always thought was like this multi-millionaire. He had this, he owned this block of apartments. He owned these m multiple businesses, Mercedes. He was my age. And he always looked stressed out and he always looked worried and he always looked, you know, like depressed. And one day he sat down with me and he told me, smile, I don't have a life. 24 hours I'm trying to pay off these debts. I'm like, but what about the rent you're collecting from the apartments? He's like, we bought those apartments 20 years ago. We're still paying off the mortgage through the, through the rent. The rent is just covering the mortgage. You're not getting anything mm. left. <laughs> mm. So like this guy owned an entire apartment building and he has no fun. He has no free time. He has no extra money. Everything he earns goes off in paying off his debts. And I could see the toll he was taking on him. We both were in our mid-20s and he looked old. You know, you stress does that to you. You look old. And he had such a miserable, you know, uh, mindset at that time like he was just depressed all the time and to get him out of that you know, eventually alhamdulillah he sold his business and, and he moved out to something he enjoyed more and 
you were able to get out of it. But at that point, it was an awakening for, to me that, you know, a lot of these people who look rich, they don't really enjoy their lives because they're in debt. To mm. look rich, you have to be in debt. And mm. that takes its toll on you, man. It really takes its toll on you. Yeah. And it's also like a fundamental point about overcoming at least that part of your ego as soon as possible, you know, about showing off yeah. and things like that. Because if you don't tackle it early on, it's going to carry with you. And like, like you said, and the, it's going to compound. Yeah. yeah That's going to have a compound effect. Like, yeah. you come to your children, like, you're going to worry about what people will say when it comes to your children. And that affects your relationship with your children. Like, yeah. You know, uh, like for me, I've got the complete opposite mindset. I'm the kind of person who does not care what anyone in the world thinks of me besides my close family. Right? Mm. Like, I literally don't care. Like people will call me whatever they want. And you know, I'm, I, I have thousands of people who hate me and call me all kinds of labels. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm still enjoying my life. I'm still mm. doing what I want to do, chasing my goals. Uh, I, I've had that mindset from a very young age, but I know a lot of people who, who can't, they like they have mm. fragile egos. One person makes a video against them and for the next two years, they're crying about that one reputation video. Yeah. It's like, you, you can't handle that attack yeah. on your ego. Yeah. You have to kill that dog. If you want to accomplish goals, if you want to go anywhere in life, you have to kill that dog. You have to realize that people are not going to like you and you're not living to please people. You're living to please Allah. It doesn't matter if that random YouTuber likes you. It yeah. doesn't. In the long run, it, it's not going to affect your dunya or your akhira. So just ignore the noise and yeah. focus on what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, the thing is, Islam and living that life is simple, but sometimes it's not easy. And it's like, but you can make it simple if you overcome yeah. these kind of barriers. And I feel like sometimes people do these activities that drain the barakah or negatively impact the life. And then they end up in a situation of compounded negativity right and in a sense obviously you have to have empathy but you can also learn from it for your own life and for the lives of your loved ones in a sense because it's like an example of what not to do and um just so for time management how how long have you got in terms of do you need to go in the next five ten minutes or do we have a bit longer do we have time today so i you can go in for at least 30 minutes more, but then I have to leave. It'll okay, be sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the next question I had, um, just on the one aspect is like, you know, about doing online da'wah, because um, you touched upon how like having people that might dislike you for whatever reason, right? Um, I remember um, I chose to come on, youtube and stuff at a relatively young age at about 24 25 uh, even though i had the same ideas and stuff for a few years early and part of the reason for that is like some people they grow online as in like they mature online but i feel like if you're in something even connected to islam and muslims that's a very dangerous path with other things you know how like people say just do it as in like minimum viable product and just get out there and like just make content with Islam or something to do with Muslims. You have to be a bit more, you have to be a bit more careful because I've seen personalities in the UK and Dawa scene and stuff that they grew in public and then I, they can still benefit people, mashallah, and people change and stuff, but I still can't get that image out of my head of where, how they started and those things that they did. So for me, it's like, I'm not going to view that person. I'm not going to talk bad about them or anything, but it's like, it's something you have to be careful about. And then one thing I learned from Tim Ferriss actually was when he said like one out of a hundred people are mental. So like if you get one comment out of a hundred, just expect that if you get a thousand views, expect 10 mental people on, I know it sounds a bit harsh, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So then you don't get yeah. mentally affected by it as much. So it's similar to what you were saying as well about the Twitter thing. Yeah, yeah. So just a few minutes ago, I posted on Twitter, uh, you know, to be loving and compassionate and merciful to your spouse. And someone said, don't bring those liberal values here. Into <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a perfect, perfect example. Okay. Um, what was the first, because I know it's a big thing when you sell your first thing online or you sell your first thing in a way that is... Um, detached from your main source of income, whether that's like side hustle or something. So people generally remember it. What was the first sale that you made online that kind of sticks in your mind if you, if you do? 
Yeah. So that would be my ebook, Getting the Baraka, an Islamic Guide to Time Management. Okay. That was my first uh, online product. And uh, it didn't go so well in the beginning, but, you know, I was actually so excited when I got that first sale for $5. Mm. Like, hold on. This is $5 separate from my income. What if a thousand more people buy this? Or what if 10,000 more people buy this? Yeah. Now, obviously, I'm thinking too big for someone that age, but it, what, what, what that $5 represented to me was possibility. Right? That's what it really represents to me. That, hold on. It is possible to have a job and have other sources of income. What if I have more? What if I have other things? That people were telling me online courses, do online courses. Right? And uh, eventually, I listened to them. I should have listened to them earlier because last year, I put out my online course on the history of Islam. And it's been exactly one year since I launched it. It has 1,400 students. MashaAllah. Right? All paid students. So Alhamdulillah, uh, for me, that's amazing. Like seriously, uh, as a side source of income, in some months, it actually outperformed my, my salary. <laughs> no, mm, So uh, at, uh, 10 years ago, I would never have imagined that. 10 mm. years ago, I honestly never, even when I sold my first book and I was getting those $5 a day over a few days, I would never imagine that a time would come where I'll put out the online course and have, Selling for fifty dollars and get a thousand sign ups within a year. It's just mm -hmm. well, it's mind blowing to me. And uh, the way I'm looking at this, hold on, the snowball effect, the compound effect. Like if I keep building more courses and ebooks, how many would I sell in a year in ten years' time? You know? Mm. How many would I sell in a year in twenty years time? We, we again most of us don't think that long. No. Mm. We we what Tony Robbins says this, we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in ten years. Yeah, I, this is our big problem. That uh, I, when I first started Islamic Self Help, I knew at least fifteen other people who started online businesses at the same time, and majority of them killed their online business within two years, right? Because he wasn't making the profits they envisioned for it. I held on. He was making maybe two hundred to four hundred dollars a month at that time. It still was something extra beyond what my income that I could use for other things, right? Uh, so I was holding on to that and building on that. And what I found is everybody I know who stuck to it for 10 years, the they, they online businesses are doing amazing, right? But it didn't do amazing for the first two years. It didn't do amazing for the first five years. It took eight to 10 years for it to really grow into something amazing. Mm. Right? In 2014, if you saw Islamic Self-Help, it's this new blog. Nobody knows who it is. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows how long it's going to be around. It's got one or two ebooks. You might not really want to buy from it. You see Islamic self-help in 2022. It's been around for a long time. There's like 20 online courses, 20 ebooks, hundreds of blog posts. It's a known name. Everyone knows it. So you're more likely to buy from it. Mm. Right? But people don't think about that. We think yeah. like, I'm going to start an online business and within a year, I'm going to be rich. I've heard so many people say this. I'm going to start an online business and within a year, I'm going to be rich. It doesn't work like that. You have to be committed to the long term. So what that first sale represents is possibility and opportunity. But you have to be committed to long-term growth. You're not going to get, uh, I, have, I have to say this because so many people think this. They think they're going to put out their first online course, their first ebook, and a thousand people are going to buy it. I, 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 don't, I don't think I've met anybody who accomplished that. Honestly, yeah, yeah. With their first ebook or their first online course. It, it takes years to, to, to reach that level. So. Just, uh, you know, that's, that's a warning to those who think that this is a shortcut. It's, it's yeah. a shortcut. It's, it's yeah. something you have to be dedicated to in the long run. Yeah, exactly. And especially for people watching, um, this is coming from someone, as you can see, someone who's very self-development orientated, very productive, um, someone who started at an early age, someone who's very capable. And if they're saying that, <laughs> it's a lesson. It's a lesson for everyone. And in like the podcasting space, I, with Optimize Muslim Project, I haven't actually, only recently I've tried to start monetizing it. But before that, um, my approach was just content focused and I wasn't really paying that much attention to it. But as you said, over time, the touch points increase. So I came across your work ages ago, but then over time, the you see it again, you see it again, then someone might see this podcast and then over time, you, their relationship with you as like the, um, teacher or content creator grows and then they're more likely they have higher trust so they're more likely um, to kind of benefit from you in a sense and another example is like with these podcasts um, the big podcasts they're all very charismatic 
very well educated very good at talking people and even they it took them 400 episodes or it took them three years of weekly episodes and that's really hard to do i've only been doing it i sometimes do a monthly episode and it's kind of still quite hard to do and you think if someone that on that level it took them that long to be discovered or get that level of success it's a long road but then the results are also kind of disproportionately good in a sense as well so um, i'm very appreciative of your time i just want to start bringing things to a close so i'm gonna ask um, i'm gonna have to decide on which topics i want to just delete prioritize <laughs> and um one was and you mentioned how you shot everything um shut everything down at 5 p.m one actually you mentioned earlier that you're only 36 37 and for some reason when i was listening doing my research i added 10 years on and i was under the assumption you were 46 47 so mashallah that's like even more of a um crazy thing but you mentioned how you kind of like to shut everything off at 5 p.m um how does that happen in practice and how do you deal with that in terms of like making sure your mind's still not going on in you can kind of have a clean close at 5 p.m. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't do that anymore. Okay. Mainly because I, I work for an American company now. Okay. So time zone differences. Uh, you know, I have all my meetings between 6 p.m. And, and 9 p.m. Because that's 9 a.m. and and a day in America. So, uh, mm. but in general, whatever other work I do, like my writing and all of that, I try to be done with all of that by 5 p.m. So 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., the only work I would do at that time would be meetings, if I have any meetings scheduled for the day. Uh, but for me, I know, for me, it just comes naturally. What I do is at 5 p.m., I open my to-do list. I tick off everything that's done for the day, put the X next to something if it didn't get done, and I make my to-do list for the next day. And for me, that that one task, it's uh, it's it's kind of like a moment of closure. Like, okay, I'm done for it. And I actually use a physical book. Like, I have a mm. physical journal, right? So I open the journal, write down what I've done for the day, write down what I want to do the next day, and I close it. And when I close it, you know, that's when my mind knows, okay, we're done. Today's over. Mm. You know, let's go and relax. And again, even my after hours are scheduled. So like after hours, I know, okay, this time is for my kids. This time I'm meeting with my friends. This time I'm spending time with my wife. You know, this time is my me time. So it's not like my mind is focused on work because I got nothing else to do. I'm focused. Like if I'm with my kids, I'm giving them quality time. I'm not thinking about work. I'm, I'm making conversation with them or teaching them or, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving them my full attention, which is something, again, a lot of us need to learn that when you're with someone, you have to give them quality time and full attention. Your mm. mind can't be somewhere else. Mm. Same for my, with my wife. Same if, same for meeting with my friends for coffee is that I will put my phone away and make eye contact and give them my full attention uh, because you want to give people quality time. That's how you build relationships, through quality time. Not just being there physically. So, you know, it, again, boils down to compartment. Uh, I can't remember the word now. Sorry, it's come to a stomach. But you're putting things to compartments, you know, mm -hmm. where, okay, work time, think about work. Kids time, focus on kids. Fam, wife time, focus on your wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you have to lock yeah. your mind out like that. Because your goal for that hour is to give that person quality time. And the same with my me time. That my goal for that hour is to relax and to recharge and, and, and to, you know, as, as an introvert, to recharge my batteries. <laughs> and so you can't mm. focus on work. Otherwise, you're just going to be draining your brain out even more. Mm. So, so really, uh, that, that's how I handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. I also feel like certain things like for me, say if you're talking to someone, I like to have podcasts when I'm fresh. So here in the UK, it's still only 11 a.m. But um, yeah. generally, say even if you're tired, because interacting with another human is kind of more natural and it increases like certain neurochemicals, it's a lot easier than kind of looking at a page or looking at a screen. So yeah. you get another burst of energy. Um, one thing I wanted to ask just quickly, the last um, topic, let's say, is another impressive thing about you is, and I, I, please share if you do have a course on this. I think I heard somewhere that you do. Um, homeschooling. You, you also homeschool your children, right? <laughs> Which again, yeah. it's another mashallah like impressive thing um i don't have any children or anything but it's something that i've been thinking about because i think it's a better solution essentially people have some misconceptions about it i wanted you to kind of 
say what are the common misconceptions uh, about homeschooling and the general advice you'd give on that interestingly my course in homeschooling with Al-Balag Academy starts in three hours so okay. like when I'm done with this three hours later will be my first lecture on homeschooling for, for this night. Uh, so they hired me to teach that course because I have 10 years of experience in homeschooling now uh, so I I didn't I mentioned I started my Ali Mia program at age 13 right but I still finished school through back then we were quality correspondence so basically the schools would mail me the books and I would take my tests at home and mail it to them and they'll mail me my reports. So essentially, I did high school from home. I never went to a high school. I did high school from home. I graduated in that way. Uh, and that saved me from a lot of fitna. That helped me a lot. And I, I was a school teacher in my early 20s. And I was terrified by what I was seeing. Like, I was taught in Islamic schools. And I did not like the environment at all. At all. Like, I literally saw... One example, I saw Molana in the break time smoking joints with the boys in the field. You know, <laughs> the Molana and the students sitting and smoking joints together. I'm like, that's the Islamic school. Uh, how much worse must be the Kufar school? <laughs> so, <laughs> so when my kids came of age, I made the decision to homeschool them. Uh, now that they're teenagers, I have to say, Alhamdulillah, that was the best decision of my life. Uh, they are very mature, very independent, uh, very deep thinkers. They have their visions and their goals and you know, they can look after themselves. Like I can leave them overnight by themselves and uh, they, they're fine. They can do everything themselves. They can cook, they can clean, they can they can defend themselves, they train the martial arts, they have their own knives. Like these are young men, not boys, even though they're 14 and 15 years old, alhamdulillah. Uh, and homeschooling is what led to that because I, I gave them quality time and I taught them the things schools don't teach. So you say that school, what, what's the misconceptions? Number one, that they're not going to socialize enough. Yeah. I would say socialization, that's up to the parents, right? If the parents are going to trap their kids in the house and cut them off from the world, yes, that's going to be a problem. But that's not how I raise my kids. My kids hope for teenage halakas. Uh, they hang out with their neighbors, hang out with their cousins. Uh, they, um, they've been for martial arts training. They've been for, for uh, soccer training. They've been for swimming classes. They made friends at all these different things. They go for day camps, right? Every second week, they attend a teenage halakha with other teenagers. So they have a social life. I, they, they have their Discord and their WhatsApp and their YouTube and the Game of Friends online. They have their social life. So anyone who feels that their kid's not going to socialize, no, they're going to socialize. It's up. The only time they're not going to socialize is you being a, a ridiculous parent and cutting them off from the world. Right? Mm. Homeschooling doesn't mean they're trapped in the house 24-7, right? Because you want them to still be part of the world. And there are many, many ways to do that. Um, so that's the first misconception. The second misconception uh, is that if they're homeschooling, then, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to go to university or they're not going to be able to get a degree. And uh, I'm proof of the fact that that's wrong. Like I said, I dropped out of school in grade eight. I did the rest from home. I still got my degree. I'm still doing well in life. Right? Uh, and again, it really depends. What, what, what's your vision for your children? Like, if your child, if you wanted to become like a doctor or, or an accountant, then yeah, maybe at least at a high school level, they'll need to go to school, right? Just just to get that 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 grade 12 qualification to enter the university, you know, with good grades. But like, if you have a family of businessmen and your child is going to start their own business at age 16, 17, uh, then you really don't have to worry at all. Like, high school curriculum is a complete waste of time. That's, that's my biggest challenge right now. My kids are in high school. And I can't motivate them to study because even I look at what they're studying and think it's a complete waste of time. It's never going to help their life. Um, and my, one of my main reasons for homeschooling is I feel our school system and school curriculum is completely outdated. It's like we're teaching 18th century subjects. You know, we're teaching them these things that are not going to benefit. Through homeschooling, I taught my kids things like personal development. I've taught them financial planning. I've taught them how to start and run your own business. Uh, they've been for martial arts training. Uh, I've taught them first aid. I've taught them, uh, you know, um, about marriage and about family life and about uh, uh, when they were the Islamic studies. You know, at the moment, for Islamic studies, we're going through the Shamayil Tilmizi together. And my kids read the hadiths and I explain it to them. Mm. I've taught them leadership training. Uh, I've, I've, I've taught them things that school children are not learning. Mm. And I wish more children had access to this. One of my long-term goals, maybe my 40s or 50s when I have the money and time, is I want to develop a new education system 
that could be rolled out globally to replace the spoon system, right? But not now. I'm too young to handle or something like that. Uh, but that's my long-term goal. But for my kids, at least the least I can do is teach them myself. And alhamdulillah, it's been very beneficial. Uh, it's also the hardest thing I've done. Like if you had to ask me what's the hardest thing you do, it's not my job. It's not running an online business. It's not dawa. It's not dealing with my haters. It's homeschooling. Because homeschooling requires a lot of time, it requires a lot of patience, it requires a lot of emotional intelligence, uh, especially when they're young, right? To, to, when they get older, it's a bit easier because they become more mature and more self-directed learners. Mm. Uh, but in the early years, and this is where a lot of people fail, like they'll start homeschooling a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, they can't handle the energy levels of that child and they just dump them in the school, right? Mm. Uh, but if you can get through that phase and 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 and, and form a bond with them at that pace and get into a, into a system at that age, uh, the quality of the relationship between parent and child as they are growing with you and you are their parent and their teacher and their mentor and you are growing together, but the quality of that love and relationship, it's on a whole different level, mm. right? Because they're giving you the love of the mentor, the love of the teacher and the love of the parent all in one person. And you develop a really strong relationship with your children that is like on a completely different level. Mm. So alhamdulillah, yeah, homeschooling is, it's the hardest thing I do, but it's also the, the thing I think I'm most proud of because uh, when I look at my teenage boys and see young men, I'm very, very proud of them. Mm, mashallah. Jazakallah khair for sharing that. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's only going to appeal because the schooling system is so deeply entrenched as like a social institution. It's only going to appeal to people who are, um, I would say, like us in the sense that we don't care too much about what other people say or like society standards and all the rest of it. So it's a by the way, for the first ten years of homeschooling, around the first five or six years of homeschooling, everybody told me it's a bad idea. Like, like mm. literally everybody, my family, my neighbors, my whole community, like, what are you doing? This is ridiculous, it's not gonna work. Mm. And now those same people are like, mashallah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because you have more time to teach them things that what's the purpose of school in a sense is to prepare it's supposed to be to prepare prepare them for adult life and earning and stuff right so now the yeah. world's changed so you can adapt and there's nothing set about the schooling system and one misconception i heard recently someone wrote a post about it that is relevant in that they said the common thing people say is oh what about socialization but if you think about it the school classroom is the only unique situation where a kid a six-year-old or let's say a 12-year-old is in a class of 30 people who are also 12-year-olds because it warps their sense of community. In no other um, aspect or area of life are people um, surrounded by people their own age. Uh, it's, so it's not even representative of everyday life. So it's kind of like a misnomer. You know, the argument about people, he won't interact or she won't interact with other kids. If you have a family system and cousins and just everyday life, even growing up, the most beneficial relationships or people that I learned from were people who are older than me anyway. So it's yeah. like, it's a bit of a misconception there as well. Yeah, well, most of my friends are in their 40s and 50s. I yeah. barely have any friends my own age. Yeah. And my kids, I see the same thing, that uh, they are able to have conversations with people of any age. Like, they can have conversations with adults. Now, they, they, they don't see it as they have to be hanging out with people the same age as them. That, that, that concept doesn't exist to them because they've never been in that environment. So they have friends of every age. Yeah. And it's like, as soon as you graduate from the system, you're thrown into the world where your colleague might be a 60 year old manager or, yeah. so it's like, it's not even a, a representative system in a sense, but Jazakallah khairan um, for your time and your, you've been very gracious in giving me the opportunity to spend time with you and learn from you. Like I said, a very inspirational person for myself and I'm sure for other Muslims as well that come across your work. So um, if you have any uh, parting thoughts, I will try and include all of your links in the description and bio. And then um, afterwards, I'll share you the relevant links and stuff as well. So I'll hand it over to you for any um, concluding remarks. Sure. So my concluding remarks is just a reminder to all of us that debt will, is inevitable. We're all going to leave this world one day. We don't know if it's soon or many decades from now. But what matters is that we leave behind sources of the jariyah, continuous reward. Right? The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that when you mm -hmm. pass away, everything comes to an end besides three things. 
your charity that continues to benefit people, your knowledge that continues to benefit people, and the righteous offspring that continue to make to offer you. So my advice to everyone, spend your life investing in these three things. Build up sources of charity that benefit continuously. Build up sources of knowledge that benefit continuously. Get married, have children, have grandchildren, have generations of, 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 of descendants who even 100 years from now, they're still remembering your name and making dua for you. Right? Mm. Because at the end of the day, we all are going to leave this world. What matters is that we leave behind deeds. You know, you know we talk about life hacks. This is the afterlife hack where you can leave behind generation upon generation upon generation of good deeds. That you could live in this world for 40 or 50 years, but your good deeds in the day of judgment could be for thousands of years. Right? And the way to do that, spend your life focusing on these three things. Right? Mm. Leaving behind sources of particular reward. May Allah accept this from us. Jazakallah mm. khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam.